Welcome to the weekly podcast of First United Methodist Church in Costa Mesa, California. Founded in 1912, the church gathers on Sundays at 10 a.m., and we invite you to join us anytime. For more information, visit our website, costamesafirstumc.com, or connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Hello, I'm Abby Johnson. I've been a longtime member of First United Methodist Church, and I'm here today to bring you the scriptures. Acts 2, 1 through 21, the coming of the Holy Spirit. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now they were de devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one of them heard speaking in a native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthenians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs in their own languages. We hear them speaking about God's deed of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with a new wine. And Peter then addresses the crowd, Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be God declares that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women in those days, will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of God for the people of God and together let us say, thanks be to God. Good morning again, and welcome to First United Methodist Church. You are now actually inside of the church. We haven't done that in a while. It is uh, good to worship together this morning. I forgot to wish you happy Pentecost earlier. This is the Sunday that we celebrate Pentecost, which is 50 days after um, Passover. There was always this celebration and meal that happened in Jerusalem. And then after Jesus' death and resurrection, we have the story of the birth of the church known as Pentecost. And so we celebrate that this morning. Your little ones may have reminded you about the imagery that goes along with Pentecost, the tongues of fire we handed these out for little ones to be able to color and kind of celebrate it. So it's filled with the Holy Spirit because it does indeed celebrate the time when the Holy Spirit fell upon the church. But there's so much more to this story and we miss so much of it when we just think about the odd imagery 
of the tongues of fire. Um, we have this beautiful imagery of it. In fact, even in the church stained glass, we have this image of a dove and the, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, descending upon the church. It is this powerful story and one of great disruption. So let us pray and then we are going to jump in. God, as always, I simply ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts would be acceptable to you. Because God, you are indeed our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Talk about disruption. This story is one of so much disruption. The people had gathered and they were used to hearing um, the message either, they were used to hearing the, the language of the empire, which would have been Latin, or Greek was most often uh, spoken out on the streets, or they were used to hearing Hebrew if they were of Jewish descent. And then here, in this moment, they hear each other's native language. It's, it's so odd and disruptive that people actually wonder if those who are hearing it and those who are speaking, if they're drunk, but then someone says it's really, really early in the morning. There's no way that that's what it is. There's a lot of disruption that happens. There's the, the sound, like a mighty wind. And we can imagine if we were in the middle of a worship service, for us, even as we record this, we can hear all the sounds of the fire trucks going by, the cars going by, things, you know, on the streets. And it's a reminder to us that even when we do church, we're in the midst of a city. The sounds are disruptive, but they're part of life. We've experienced disruption as we've been sheltering in place, quarantined from each other, and, and the church will not be the same. See, the thing about any change that happens is that it's going to be disruptive. If we want to call this the beginning moment of the church, it's one that's born out of disruption. And I personally have not had a child. Um, I was born myself, but I know that whenever a baby is born or a new life is created or something new, there is disruption. It is not a quiet situation. It is not the cleanliest of situations. It is this disruptive moment. As we have been trying to figure out what's next as a community, we are being disrupted. All the plans that we want to come up with or how we think things will work out, it's, it's almost like we're experiencing newness, a new way of doing church. People use the word the new normal, but there's nothing normal about this. We've never done this before, except there are things that we are used to, things that are familiar. For those who heard their language being spoken, it was familiar, but it was disrupting in the way that church or gathering or temple had been. It was a reminder of what it was gonna be to be part of the kingdom of God. See, it wasn't about we are going to have people learn how to speak and be like us. Instead, we are going to experience other people and we are going to mutually be changed. This has been a very disruptive week. We have heard stories of great injustice. And when we hear these kind of things, it's disruptive. But it's important for us to listen to the voices speaking in the native tongue, saying the thing that they need to say in the way that they need to say it. See, just like there was a, a supreme language or an understanding that this was sort of the church looked a certain way or, or this was the way that it was going to be, this disruptive moment changed all of it. Even the disciples will have to learn how to include people that they weren't expecting. And so we hear this moment, and, and right after this, and, and it's so interesting, you know, this fire, tongues of fire, people speaking um, their languages that they never knew. The, the odd thing about it is, and then they just keep going. Peter gives this speech. I'm laughing, actually, because within uh, the latest state information that they were given, uh, that we were given as pastors, they said, please keep your speeches short. And I am reminded of uh, my nephew when I was preaching one time, and he was able to be there in Nashville. And uh, he was put in the children's time, and right after he, you know, they had like a separate little area for the children, and he wanted to go play, and he was excited, but he came out and said, Aunt Sarah, your speeches are too long. Next time, can you do a shorter speech? 
the speech is actually a sermon that Peter will give. And it'll be one that will be familiar, just like a language that people are used to hearing. He will preach from Joel, the second chapter. But if, if we listen to Joel, you're going to hear some differences between what Acts says and what Joel says. Again, it's a slight, subtle difference, and it's a little bit disruptive to what was heard before. So this is from Joel 2:28 through 32. God's spirit poured out, then afterwards, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female slaves in those days, I will pour out my spirit. I will show portions in heaven and on earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Great and terrible day of the Lord. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. Isn't it interesting? There are three differences. Dr. Matt Skinner, um, a, a professor of the New Testament, points out the three differences. First, Joel says, then afterwards. Whereas Peter, in quoting it, says, in those days as if now, now is the days that Joel was speaking about. So there's something important about what has happened since this disruption. This is the thing you've been waiting for. And then the other thing that's a little bit different is that the Joel scripture says even the male and female slaves, but the way that Peter quotes it, it's even my male and female slaves. The word slaves is horrible, horrible. And yet there is a slight nuance that we can hear there where God is calling even those that they consider the least of them my, acclaiming they are part of the kingdom of God. It doesn't mean slavery is right, but it means that there is an identity that being part of this even more. The third thing that's different as it says, and then they shall prophesy. And that's at referring to all the people, even the slaves that were mentioned before. All of us will be equal in this disrupted kingdom of God. Hearing in the natural language is just the beginning of the disruption. Now, when Joel talks about prophecy, it's not the kind of prophecy, like, it's not fortune telling. He's not speaking into the future. Instead, he's speaking of a truth that is already present. If we think about Pentecost as just the start, which is really like, that's what we call it, right? We call it the birth of the church. This is the start of everything. It's interesting that it starts with disruption and it's more than just language because it's also the inclusion of people and the inclusion of all of us prophesying. Now, sometimes that word has been used in odd ways, but prophesying, if we talk about it as this idea of just speaking the truth, what it means is it kind of notices when in our story, when in the experiences we're having, when the kingdom of God is present. That's what prophecy is. It's a, it's a sense of, I'm telling the truth in this moment, or truth telling. When we think about this last week, and we've heard all kinds of things from um, different declarations coming from over here, we hear these awful stories of injustice, and then we hear the response, and there's disruption. We, as people who profess to be part of the story of the kingdom of God, are the people who should be letting the voices be heard that are speaking in their native tongue to speak of the pain that they've gone through. Sometimes it's about listening and hearing the voices, the voices on the margins, the voices of those who are calling out, speaking their native language. We hear stories like the one of George Floyd, and we can't help but be affected by it and feel this disruption. Systematic change needs to happen, and, and we know that. And, and even in the church, as the church was being born, it wasn't born in this perfect state. It, it has so much and continues to have so much that needs to be disrupted. But sometimes we want the Holy Spirit to be like a, like a warm hug and when we go through things like 
we just have with having to be apart from each other and figuring out what is the church, how is the church relevant to the here and now. We may miss out on what the Spirit is doing if we don't allow the disruption to happen. I meet weekly with a bunch of pastors and just a wonderful group of people. And one man came and he was saying uh, he was, you know, really excited about the fact that he thought, oh great, my church can open on Pentecost Sunday. This is how the spirit is moving. And then we listed all the things that would need to be in place before his community could open. And he said, all of this is so scary. Who knew that being a pastor could be so scary? Well, the truth is, being someone who is asked to be prophetic, asked to be part of the disruption, is scary. But we are partnering with the Spirit in it. We are having eyes to see the not yet. We are being asked to be part of what moves things closer and closer toward the kingdom of God, where justice and love and inclusion like people speaking the language that they're used to. Nothing feels better than someone trying to understand you in your own native language, and whether that's an actual language or the way that you talk or, or the method that you talk. I think about how many people have had to learn a new form of communication in the midst of this. What is God doing? What is this disruption doing? Well, just like the people um, had to figure out after Peter spoke, we gotta figure out what is next with the Spirit is with us. And as we look at the news and as we hear all that's going on, the question becomes, where are we hearing the Spirit? What feels like the kingdom of God? Friends, let us pray as we continue to learn what it means to be the church. God, we are grateful for all the ways that you call us into something different, and God, we admit that sometimes disruption is not comfortable. Sometimes disruption makes us angry at first. Sometimes we are confused. Sometimes we want to blame other people um, for being off of it, whether like in the early days when they said they must be drunk. But God, you are always present. You are not the God of the past. You are the God of the now tomorrow. You're the God that continues to be present with us. So as we experience disruption, would you point out those places where your voice can be heard and where your spirit can be seen? And God, when we be the kind of people who partner with you to bring about justice in the kingdom of God. Amen.